We are live. Good morning. Welcome to the fourth international ophthalmic conclave hosted by the All India Ophthalmological Society. This is a three day event, 12 hours each day, incorporating 21 extremely good sessions on all the subspecialties in ophthalmology, right from eyelid to the orbit. Of course, cataract, glaucoma, cornea, everything. We have a very special day in India today. It's our Republic Day, it's the 75th Republic Day. And to begin the session, before which we would uh, play the national anthem, after which Dr. Harvan Slal, the president of All India Ophthalmological Society, will make the opening this would not have been possible without the efforts of AIOS governing council Dr. Harban Slal, being the president of AIOS, uh, heads the All India Ophthalmological Society at this point in time. I request him to make the opening remarks. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this uh, conclave was started at the time of the COVID, but seeing its uh, usefulness and utility, and thousands of people keep on watching over a period of time because it becomes a very good resource for years to come. So this is a very good uh, endeavor by the AIS and uh, I really thank Santosh Shonavar for making a wonderful program and with more than uh, 100 international faculty and 150 national faculty, this program is going to be the, a big resource for all the members of the AIS. Not only AIS, in fact, any, anybody from anywhere on the earth can watch this program. And that's all. I think uh, I hand over back to this person. So good morning, everyone. I welcome you all to this wonderful morning. So we all know that cataract surgery has now become a refractive surgery. And the goal is to get emetropia across all distances. So keeping this in mind, we will switch on with our first session, that is Cataract Surgery 2024, Goal Emetropia. To moderate this session, I invite Dr. Gaurav Luthra, sir. Dr. Gaurav Luthra, sir, is based in Dehradun in India, and he is an excellent teacher and the surgeon. Over to you, sir. Gaurav, you are muted. You are mu muted, Dr. Gaurav. Thanks. So, I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Aarti, and thanks, Dr. Santosh and Harban, sir, for uh, uh, you know hel helping us organize this session. I also want to welcome Dr. Maipal, sir, whose uh, uh, video is off, but he's just joined, I think, from the road, and he's yeah, the yeah, chairperson yeah. for this meeting. Uh, and all the panelists. So I would, uh, you know, want to welcome uh, all this, all our panelists today: Dr. Rohit Omprakar, Dr. T. P. Lahane, uh, Dr. D. Ramamurthy, Dr. Chitra Ramamurthy, Dr. Mohan Rajan, uh, Dr. Kumar Doctor, who are all renowned uh, cataract surgeons, and for this very interesting session, which is uh, basically on what am I doing new in 2024. We requested all our amazing speakers to be speaking on what they are doing new in 2024. We also have with us other panelists: Dr. Partha Biswas. Uh, who is the president uh, elect? He's uh, the incoming president, I think. Dr. J. S. Tikyal, sir, chief of RP Center. Dr. Arup Chakravarti, again, all renowned uh, national faculty from India. And we are very lucky to have with us a stellar international faculty who have uh, all uh, very nicely, kindly, you know, kind of spared their time for this uh, session at a very odd hours. So we have with us uh, Dr. Ron uh, Yeo from Singapore. Again, he's no stranger to uh, India. He has uh, been uh, in and out of India so many times. He's the amazing organizer also of the APCRS meetings and I get to meet him in almost all international meetings and do his amazing work. 
Dr. Mayank Nanavati, who's from the UK. Again, he's a fantastic cataract surgeon, has been innovating uh, lots of uh, new, uh, you know, uh, techniques and uh, uh, with IL technology. Uh, we would like to welcome him. Uh, Dr. Brad Dr. Bradley Randleman from the US, who's again renowned for the Randleman criteria, does amazing stuff with refractive and cataract. And we're hoping that he'll be able to join. He had some visa issues, uh, was in travel. We have, of course, with us uh, Dr. Boris Malugin, a dear friend and uh, from uh, Moscow. We've been lucky to visit him and he's a pioneer and innovator of so many things. Uh, we are again thankful to him for joining us today. And then we have with us uh, none other than Dr. Arun Gulani, who's not only an, a fantastic um, artist uh, for cornea, refractive and cataract surgery, but also an amazing uh, designer uh, in his own right. And uh, welcome, Arun, and thank you again for sparing time. And uh, I think with that, we should start off the session once uh, the chair permits. Dr. Mahipal, sir, would you like to... Uh, yeah, take thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gaurav, and welcome, everyone, and happy Republic Day. I think welcome to this session. Uh, without uh, uh, much ado, I think uh, we can really go on to... And uh, great to see Gaurav uh, dressed in the Republic Day. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, anyway, uh, we can start with the first. I think Dr. Ron Yeo is coming on first, right? Yes. Dr. Ron? Yes. yes. Hi, Welcome to this session and thanks very much for joining in. Uh, always a pleasure listening to you. So uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank can you. I share my screen now, Aarti? Yes. Sure, sir. Sure. So thank you very much and happy Republic Day to everyone um, in, in India. Let me just see whether I can get my slide show up. There we go. So um, <clears throat> when when Gaurav invited me to say what I'm doing differently in 2024, I thought I'd talk about this, uh, whether there's another option in press B correcting quiver. So this is new to me, but it may not be new to all of you in India because you're so advanced. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, as you all know, I mean, in terms of press B correcting options, we're all familiar with the diffractive trifocal, zonal segmental refractive uh, IOLs, but there are issues with quality of vision, glare halos, etc. Of late, EDOF IOLs have really come to the fore. They have about one and a half diopters of ad, but they're expensive and they're not always predictable. So there are issues there as well. And of course, traditional mon monovision is something that we've practiced for many years using monofocal IOLs, aiming plano in one and one and a half or two diopters in the other. But you sometimes end up neither here nor there and you still need backup glasses, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not bad. I mean, we have a reasonable range of options, but could it be better? Well, you all know Graham Barrett very well. And, you know, Graham's worked on all these formulae that we use routinely. And it's worth noting that Graham, all these years, he's just retired last week, by the way, uh, has never used trifocals nor EDOF uh, IOLs. He always used monofocal IOL monovision. And so to, to really, I suppose, help that, he designed together with Rayner, the EMV1RAO, the, the 210 IOL, especially for monovision use. Now, I understand this lens has actually been launched in India a few years, and it's actually quite popular, but this is new to me. So I'm sorry if this is old hat to all of you in India. And just a quick word or two about the EMV. It gives you a, 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 up to one and a half diopters of an emitropic target. It's non-diffractive. And it uses positive spherical aberration to provide a really like an extended depth of focus uh, capability. Now, the, the Ray-1 EMV uh, re basically introduces positive SA uh, to extend the depth of vision, but it also gives you less disc photopsia because the, it, it's a non-diffractive design. And we can see from this graphic that compared to uh, zero spherical aberration when we have the positive SA, and it's about plus 0.15 of positive SA, you get about one and a half diopters of a stretched uh, focus. And here's the, the focus curve, and you can see with the first eye on the left, if you aim for plano, you get a little bit of intermediate, but when you add it to the second eye targeting minus one, uh, offset, you get a pretty useful range of vision, which is shown here in this particular diagram. And you can see at the bottom, which is the EMV1, you get a range of vision from dominant, uh, from far all the way to near, if you do that offset. Whereas with the traditional monofocal mono IOLs, you know, it, it does distance and it does intermediate, but near is a little bit uh, wanting. And of course, it comes fully preloaded, which is very nice. And and, and and I think it's been quite a useful addition 
uh, to our armamentarium. <clears throat> now, whenever I'm using a new IOL, a new, as I said, new to me in Singapore, um, I ask a few questions. Does the lens deliver what's promised? Are the A constants valid? New injector systems we have to learn? Are there any unknown issues? Is there a toric? Many manufacturers like J and J are still launching their Pure C without a toric uh, IOL, and it makes it very hard to use these lenses in any numbers. Are the torics stable? So I've only had this lens a couple of months, and I've been able to implant just about a dozen of these lenses. Half of them in basically normal eyes, and people who basically wanted monofocal, but when I discussed with them, they were quite happy to try the the Rainer. Uh, four post LASIK eyes and a couple of monocular uh, implantations, second eyes and ones with unocular uh, cataract. And my early impressions, and I've got a, a week up to nearly two months of follow-up only with this group of patients, are that in, this, in, in the near eye, I've been targeting about minus 0.75 rather than one, and they're all basically N6 or better for intermediate or near, and the distance is 618 or better, usually better than 618. And in the dominant eye for distance, when I target Plano, they get about N8 or better for intermediate and near, and 612 or better for far. And basically, all these uh, 12 eyes that I've done, everyone rated the lens very highly. They were very happy with the outcome. Uh, um, it's a little bit like a free lunch, right? I mean, if you're paying for just a monofocal lens and you have a range of vision, it's actually not a bad thing uh, to have. So what are some of the issues? I mean, preloaded, it's easy to load, but I find that the 2.2 is a bit tight. You need a 2.4. The toric versions are very easy to implant, and actually it rotates in both directions, like the plate haptics that we are so familiar with from Zeiss. But it is a hydrophilic IOL, and some people don't like that. Although in Europe, the hydrophilic IOLs, I think, are very well accepted. And if you get PCO, I mean, most of us end up yagging our capsules uh, anyway. So here's just a case of a... <clears throat> Of really, I think this was the first or the second uh, case of the uh, EMV one that I implanted. <coughs> I did a largish rexis, and the preload is nice, and I think it's a way to go for all of us. And here's the OVD just going into that little well on top of the IOL, and when you inject that, it just fills up that little space there. You see the fluid, the OVD just going in, and then you close those two butterfly wings with a snap, and then you just inject the lens in. As I said, you need a slightly bigger wound. I mean, 2.2 is a bit tight. 2.4, it works very well. And as you open the lens and, and you inject in, it really behaves really like any other uh, foldable acrylic-based uh, uh, lens implant. Of course, the haptics have this closed-loop system, um, which is actually easy to handle. It's easy to engage the hole in, in the haptic. And when you position the lens, you can see the toric uh, line markings there. It's very, very easy to rotate into position. <clears throat> so I, I, I mentioned this earlier that with any new IOLs, I asked a number of questions. So in, in this early experience, do they deliver what's promised? Yes, I, I found that we have been getting indeed the one and a half diopters of air. Um, Graham has uh, optimized the A constant and recommends 118.3. Although I noticed when I target a minus 0.75, I'm getting slightly more myopic outcomes and I may uh, tune that down a little bit. The injector system is easy. I've had no unknown issues so far. And the Torix have been launched together with this, which is good. And it seems very stable. <coughs> so here's a question I'm going to ask many of the refractive people uh, on, on this uh, panel. Maybe Arun or, or, or Maya, you can comment. I was told by Rainer that if you already have existing high spherical aberrations, which a, a post-myopic laser eye would have, you perhaps shouldn't use this uh, positive spherical aberration lens, which will add more positive SA to an already high positive SA. And I'd be uh, grateful for your comments shortly. And whether we can use it in pathological eyes, we don't know yet. So my rationale for considering the EMV1 is that this is like monovision revisited, but using a lens that's designed for it rather than the box standard monofocal IOL with greater anisometropia. With this, we can target one or less um, monovision. You get monofocal optical quality, but perhaps what's more important, we're going to get monofocal pricing. And the patients get, get this free lunch. Uh, 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 they're absolutely delighted. So I do feel that the EMV1 is indeed another arrow in the press biopic correcting IOL quiver. Thank you very much. And welcome to Chen Tu. Thank you so much, sir, for that enlightening talk. 
so dr arun you are here he's going to feed his cat <laughs> so so maybe I, since, uh, uh, so dr mohan rajan sir we would like to know your views on this talk no as usual good morning sir uh, dr ram ron good morning mohan good morning good morning good morning everybody good morning president uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, i have not used this ray one lens but i know the results are very good uh, many of my colleagues are using it i i am i'm using a lot of uh, eye hands and i'm using a lot of impress lens which is coming from oya which has got a similar technology as well this is the way to go in the future because i don't put a regular uh, uh, unifocal lenses for all my patients i either put this uh, these lenses which is unifocal plus lens or monofocal plus lens we call it or we go on to the next level that is the eda of lens or the trifocal lenses uh, these are the three categories we tell the patients but the fun, the results are really fantastic only thing is other eye i don't make it minus 1 because if we make it sometimes minus 1 it go to 1.25 the patient become very unhappy one eye the first eye i don't believe in plano in dominant or non dominant eye the first eye i make it for plano emetropy of a distance the other eye i aim for about minus 0.5 to 0.75 the inner and quality of this lens is that because of that uh, the uh, the uh, the near vision also at 40 50 cm is much better so that's what i would say and even for post myopic eyes i use it hypopic uh, lasik patients uh, that's the there is a thing because you cannot use uh, uh, you need to go in for a zero so, um, uh, ablation lenses like in vista i uh, yeah. use for hypopic post hypopic lasik but there is no absolutely no contraindication even if there is a macular pathology a glaucoma everything just like a monofocal plus a mon monofocal lens you can use this as well so that is the advantage you opened up a new vista for all of us thank you am i my comment Uh, i think uh, whenever you get this uh, depth of uh, focus or multifocality there is always some loss of contrast i'll, I'll just narrate one interesting uh, patient i just few days back i operated he had in the first eye eye hands with he had a refractive error of minus 1.25 so he was very unhappy he came to me he was very learned he researched everything so i removed that lens and put on a vbt iul in that eye so with the vbt his distance vision was okay because he wanted distance close vision but he said ki my near vision is not as sharp as it was with the eye hands because that was a mono vision for reading by vbt had some vision for near but i can make the see the mobile so he was not still happy now he wanted to go for he had already studied ki iul can be removed within 4 weeks of time i mean so he was not happy then i put the second i this synergy iul i said you, if you are not happy you go for the second iul and after that you decide which iul to be removed and which iul to be kept if you want to vitty to be cut and removed i remove the vitty and put the synergy in that if you are happy with both of them <coughs> and he was very clear that the sharpest vision he got was with the premium monofocal synergy was very good for reading but distance vision was not as sharp as vitty was so this is the one man who had all the three lenses and had experience of all of them so the the premium monofocal gives you the clearest and uh, sharpest vision all other aid of lenses will have some loss of contrast and a compromise as you keep on adding more for the near there is a little compromise for the distance so synergy had excellent reading vision but he could compare the synergy with vbt and say ki uh, vbt was better for distance than synergy while both of them were emetropic yeah i fully agree with you abhish i think uh... Uh, if you go for eda of there uh, are of course in eda of lenses there is no splitting of the light there is stretching and shifting uh, in vbt but in all the trifocals there is splitting of light when you have splitting of light there will be loss oh, of light. one actually it was all three were red but this same patient having who is who is really a scholar he studied everything and giving the experience of all the three lenses in one go <laughs> that that was that was fantastic. I think I think you can. I was prepared and I was prepared to remove any of the lenses <laughs> and put the another lens. I mean, if yeah, you, 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 you can publish, you can publish this in <laughs> IDO. <laughs> I just wanted to ask Mayang, you know, what's your experience of the Rayner lens in, in in the UK? Is it popular? And and, and what about this um, post myopic LASIK use? Uh, yeah, Aaron, thank you so much for this nice presentation. Um, yes, the Rayner EMV is getting very popular uh, in the UK. I don't use it too much because the only drawback is hydrophilic nature, uh, and we can only use it in private sector. Now, just to give you a brief background of uh, for the audience, there, uh, 
You know, we know that the negative spherical abrasion is very important for uh, near vision. And we have been using that for eczema laser platforms. If you do a custom Q treatment, for example, on a patient with minus 0.3 uh, microns of spherical abrasion, which is a negative spherical abrasion, the patient will get nice near vision. Now, that same principle has been taken over by so many lens industry um, um, colleagues um, to produce all these uh, high EBI lenses to give near vision or monovision plus or EDOF lenses. Graham Barrett was the only one who actually produced a lens with a positive spherical abrasion. Now, the issue with the positive spherical abrasion is it induces myopia of, um, this particular lens induces myopia of minus 0.75. So if you target zero diopters um, with EMV, you will actually get a refractive error uh, when you manifest refract this patient of minus 0.75. So what Reina is suggesting is to have a mini monovision scenario where the patient has a minus 0.75 in the other eye or minus one. It, so that will mean that the patient will actually end up with minus one and a half or minus 1.75, which is a big difference between the two eyes. So when implanting this lens, it's important to understand that this, these patients will have minus 0.75 diopters of manifest refraction, even if you have targeted emetropia postoperatively. So uh, my one question to everyone is that should monofocals be replaced totally by monofocal plus lenses? Yes, yes. sir. Yes. We have replaced it. No, I, I think even the, I had I had patient who really complained of the loss of contrast. And this, I mean, if you want the sharpest image, it will always be monofocal. There should be no doubt about it. And whatever lens, whether it's a premium monofocal or anything, the only how much loss of contrast is, if it's a 3% or 7% or 20% is the issue. But if you want a sharpest vision, it will always be monofocal. So, Harbans, I have implanted technus one uh, slash eye hands in my brother's one eye, second eye. He prefers the eye hands, actually. No, eye hands gives them better landing uh, this thing because the yeah. loss of contrast is very less. Very little. Now, so that's what I'm saying. The, yeah, the plus point point is... I agree with you, but if you yeah. ask the optics wise, because the, in the and eye hands, you of course, because we are now, we don't have to look at the infinity most of the time. And as the age advances, we are more into the indoors and looking to the mobile laptop and the nearby things. So a little bit of myopia actually is uh, uh, no disadvantage at that and you are more comfortable for that. So I was just going on from where Mohan said that in my practice now I rarely use the normal monofocal. I have uh, totally switched over to the yeah, monofocal because the price, dif price difference is very little yeah. and the uh, people can get uh, some reading ability at least like Access. computers and phones which yeah. are uh, your normal things today. Yeah. In fact, actually when I use the eye hands lens, I use the uh, second minus, usually around minus 0.5 target, while in the technician okay. I might target around ametropia. So that the patient has got good uh, mobile uses if possible. Thank you. Uh, just yes, to sir. add on that, in the UK, uh, the public sector has also uh, now started contracting with J&J &J for IHANS. So very soon, entire NHS system will be using um, IHANS. Not able to hear he is uh, audible, sir. I, I think we can go to the next topic. Yeah. yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ron. So, uh, next, we would like to invite Dr. Mayank to talk on predicting pseudo accommodation. So, over to you, Dr. Mayank. Thank you so much. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, you can go on the slideshow mode, and then we are good to start. Um, so thank you so much, Gauro and, and team, uh, for your kind invitation. Um, this is an exciting topic for me because my um, entire research journey is based on intraocular lenses. These are my uh, financial disclosures. Um, now, just to give you a brief, brief history about pseudo accommodation, um, we know that against the rule, corneal astigmatism increases the odds of occurring pseudo accommodation 10 times compared to a normal any type of corneal accommodation. So against the rule, astigmatism was known to give pseudo accommodation. We also know Strum's conoid from Duke Elders um, that it gives a more pseudo accommodation. Um, we also know that aspheric lenses, which were introduced about 20 years ago, gives mesopic contrast vision, but takes away pseudo accommodation because it gives more sharper uh, distance focus, more contrast vision, but doesn't help with uh, the near vision. 
Uh, and that's because there's no spherical abrasion there. And also spherical abrasion is pupil size dependent, which again varies from patient to patient. And therefore certain lenses work in some patients, certain doesn't. Um, we did a lot of prospective randomized studies about 15 years ago. Uh, one of them was this, comparing um, a spheric lenses with um, spherical lenses. This particular study was comparing Alcon IQ versus the Alcon SN60. And uh, we found a difference of 0.46 diopters in the depth of focus um, between the two groups. Uh, we also looked at uh, the vertical comma abrasion. Now, vertical comma abrasion gives you uh, a pseudo accommodation because it's like astigmatism. It's like with the rule astigmatism and um, the vertical comma um, uh, abrasion is more helpful for letters which are vertically oriented, such as English, English letters. If you look at South Indian um, letters which are horizontally oriented, uh, you may find horizontal comma to be better in these patients. And vertical comma abrasion values also are high in spherical abrasion because if there is slight decentration, you will get more, um, more changes in vertical comma compared to uh, no de decentration. So we also looked at the tilt and decentration of these uh, lenses, and we found that aspheric uh, IOLs lose their advantages if they're decentered and they induce more of these kind of tertiary uh, abrasions, and uh, which may or may not be helpful in these patients. So if if they have more vertical comma, if because of decentration, they might be able to read better compared to um, patients who are more centered and so forth. Now, this is the diagram of um, the positive and negative spherical abrasion, which Ron has very nicely shown us before. Uh, as I mentioned, negative spherical abrasion uh, is well known to produce a near focus. Uh, positive spherical abrasion within the lens was first time introduced by Graham Barrett, um, which is in the ray one EMV technology, whereas most of the other lenses like IHANS, uh, we have also started using POC, which is uh, in competition with Vivity. POC is from John Johnson Johnson. Um, those lenses use high Abbey, in my personal opinion, although the company doesn't um, disclose the technology, and that will induce more negative spherical abrasion. Uh, this is the, the ray diagram of... Um, um, the negative and positive vertical comma abrasion. These pictures are freely available online from my own PhD thesis uh, from City University, London. Uh, now, we conducted an ESCRS funded, funded study called as MERO, um, which is now published, the part one is now published in journal Cataract and Refractive Surgery. Um, the MERO stands for the Monofocal Extended Range of uh, Vision Study. Uh, my co-investigators were David Spolton and Katie Bunce from London. So the part one of the study looked at the incidence of pseudo accommodation after simple monofocal intraocular lens. And we used a ray one simple lens, which is the, uh, the ray one non EMV lens in the study. And um, we wanted to find the factors responsible for pseudo accommodation. Um, and the part two study later on was to actually see the entire population of these patients and find out the normal reading speed and the reading font size in a monofocal uh, lens patient. Because we talk about enhanced monofocal, we talk about EDOF lenses, but actually, do we actually know what is the normal reading performance of a monofocal intraocular lens patient without pseudo accommodation? So we wanted to know that as well. So the part one study, the aim, as I mentioned, was to see how many patients achieved 2040 and 0.2 logma, which is J4, um, both together without glasses, and we wanted to know the factors responsible for that. Um, I, I won't go into the, the details of the study, but this is, this is basically a prospective non-blinded study done at Brighton in the United Kingdom. We wanted to see the patients at one and three months, but then because of the pandemic, we had to extend the second follow-up up to nine months. Um, and we, we collected all the patients who had no complications at the time of surgery. The primary outcome was, as I mentioned, to look at the incidence. Secondary outcome was to look at the factors. Um, this again is a busy slide, but basically we recruited 412 patients um, within the NHS system, um, of which we had data of 301 because we lost about 111 patients during the pandemic. And then we uh, analyzed the data of 301 patients. So of those 301, we had 29 patients who were spectacle independent after monofocal intraocular lens, which means the incidence of pseudo accommodation is 9.4 percent generally, which is in line with previously published literature uh, many years ago as well. And the, the new lenses don't change that. Now, this is a very busy slide, um, essentially giving you the baseline data of all eyes versus patients uh, with good vision, uh, pseudo accommodation and, and no pseudo accommodation. Won't go into details of that. Uh, but that's already published in JCRS. Now, we wanted to know individually which factors are responsible for um, pseudo accommodation individually without uh, any interference with other factors. 
And the univariate analysis, which is the finding out the independent factors, found preoperative anterior chamber depth, spherical abrasion, um, and uh, spherical equivalent to be important. And these are the values. So if you look at the pre-op ACD, a shorter the ACD, more chances you will get pseudo accommodation. Uh, myopic, the spherical equivalent, more chances you'll get pseudo accommodation. Uh, spherical abrasion near zero, by the way, more chances you'll get um, uh, pseudo accommodation and mesopic pupil size uh, smaller uh, will be better for pseudo accommodation. Now, what if we combine all the factors together and find out the interplay of factors um, uh, to look at the pseudo accommodation? And we found these four factors. Now, as you can see, the factors are similar except for the actual length. The pre-op ACD is not significant, but pre-op actual length is important, which means the shorter the actual length. In other words, hyperopic patients, slightly hyperopic patients, uh, leaving them slightly myopic afterwards with almost zero spherical abrasion with a smaller pupil size are more likely to be um, uh, getting pseudo accommodation than uh, otherwise. Uh, and this is the only difference. So the difference, difference between univariate and multivariate was that uh, pre-op ACD was significant only when we considered independent factors. And when we, when we considered all the factors together, it was preoperative actual length. And why was this? Because uh, some of the factors listed in this table on the left were uh, independently correlating to the factors on the right, which means there was interplay of correlations and it was quite complex. And therefore, uh, multivariate analysis in such studies is very important than univariate because there will be interplay of factors um, within the factors themselves. So the part one concluded that we had um, about 9% um, pseudo accommodation in the in the patients and the factors responsible were low myopic spherical equivalent, low total uh, spherical abrasion, shorter pre-op actual length and smaller pupil size. And factors that do interplay with each other. Now, what about part two study? Part two study was looking at all these 301 eyes, uh, one eyes of the patients to look at what is a normal reading speed. We are not uh, dividing patients with pseudo accommodation. We just want to know what is a normal reading speed of these patients. And for this, we employed the Salzburg reading desk, which is a scientific instrument to, to actually note down the words per minute and the font size. Uh, again, the same population of patients. And this is a video of how we use the Salzburg reading desk. Um, if you haven't um, seen this, you can actually adjust the contrast on the screen. You can also adjust the distance. The patient wears a sticker on the forehead, which is a sensor from the screen, which measures the distance from the screen. And the patient is asked to read um, the paragraph on the screen, which then uh, is recorded by the sensor and it produces the number uh, of words per minute and the font size the patient was able to read at that distance. Um, this is the same data, data set as I mentioned earlier uh, with the same 301 patient. And this is what we found. So uncorrected reading speed on the Salzburg reading desk was 130 words per minute. Um, so, and what is a normal reading speed? Now the normal reading speed for just reading leisurely, for example, reading a newspaper uh, is 80 words per minute, which is very low. And it's surprising that a, a normal monofocal which is non IHANS or non EDOF or non monofocal plus patient can also read 130 words per minute easily. Uh, and this is the table form of the same information. Now, what about the font size? Uh, the font size in logma is 0.48 uh, logma, um, which is slightly bigger. And I'll show you in an in a end chart as well um, very soon. But this is the table form of that. This is where the patients normally rest when they have monofocal lens with the font size uh, around 4.48 um, log bar. Uh, these are the secondary outcomes of the, of the second study, which are not very important. So the conclusion of the part two was majority of the patients with monofocal intraocular lens can read unaided a font size of between point four to point six logma, which equates to 2050 or 2080 and N6 or N10. The reading speed uh, varies from 100 to 165 words per minute. So how far is the technology from achieving pseudo accommodation predictively in, um, in all the eyes today? And for that, we need to understand the classification of the modern lenses as um, already mentioned by Ron earlier. So we have got this monofocal, which we studied in this um, uh, um, uh, funded study, um, but we also have enhanced monofocals such as uh, IHANS um, and uh, Ray1 EMV, ISOPure. We have got EDOFs uh, such as uh, Symphony, Luxmart, Vivity, and now POC from Johnson Johnson. We've got trifocal lenses like Panoptics, Physiol, Fine Vision, Synergy, 
uh, Ray 1 trifocal, etc. Now, I'm not going to confuse you with monovision. Um, uh, just look at these lenses, and all these lenses have got their own drawbacks. Uh, some of them are pupil dependent, some of them are um, causing dysphotopsia because of the diffractive technology. But this is a nice paper published recently in AJO. Um, and this compares um, the trifocals with EDOPS, and it gives you the uncorrected near vision and distance corrected near vision in this table. I would like you to focus on the uncorrected near vision, the mean of which is 0.18 logma. So what does that mean? So this is uh, the simple N vision chart for, for reading. And you can see here that the monofocal intraocular lens patients can read in the range which is highlighted in the box above, which is between N6 to N10, but the EDOF lens um, patients will read about N4.5, which is a, one or two fonts smaller than a monofocal lens. So in other words, the EDOF lenses do give a slightly better near vision, but they're not as good as a trifocal. I'll go back to the same slide here. You look at the, the means of the trifocal, uh, they're much better, but the trifocal has got its own disadvantage of causing glare and halos. So the technology is, is moving forward, but most of these uh, EDOP lenses will have some uh, or other drawback. For example, Luxmart is pupil dependent um, and, uh, and uh, uh, Rivet is refractive, so they, they will also cause some glared halos. And so final conclusions, majority of the patients with monofocal intraocular lens can, um, can have a font size of 0.4 to 0.6 easily, can read between N6 and N10 without glasses with a speed of 100 to 165 words per minute. Uh, by the way, the lowest um, uh, uh, allowable uh, reading recreational speed is about 80 words per minute, and the literature suggests EDOF lenses are not too far away from um, the monofocal lenses. We are not talking about enhanced monofocal, but simple monofocal, and therefore the difference between the EDOFs and the monofocal lens um, is all the short, uh, but significant, and therefore EDOF needs much more tweaking in future, um, and we need to control pupil size in order to predict pseudo, pseudo accommodation in these patients. Hopefully with the VUT and other drops which are in the market for press biopia correction may also be combined with the lens technology to, to see how we can predict pseudo accommodation in all these patients. Thank you so much. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Wonderful talks. Yeah, excellent, yeah. Talk, man. Uh, very nicely, uh, you know, explained and died. For, I mean, for considering that today everybody is trying to find out which is going to be the best uh, lens for uh, their patients between the EDOFs and the intermediates and the trifocals, I think this makes a lot of sense. Uh, so I think uh, there was a question uh, which was put up by uh, you know, somebody in the audience. Uh, Arti was just mentioning about uh, dominance. So is that, uh, can, can you uh, again tell us the question? One, I'll just read it out. Uh, it's, the question is to Dr. Mohan Rajan. He mentioned no need to see for dominance of the eye. First eye correcting for distance and second eye target myopia of minus 0 0.75. Does this approach suit all patients and how is the adoption? How is the adaptation? Sorry. You're asking me? Yes. Yeah. That question was put up for you, I think, because for some comment. No, no, no problem. I don't believe in this dominant and dominant eye. Whichever eye and operating first, I aim for hemetropia plano. The other eye, I titrate, depending on whatever the patient is he wants, and you go for minus 0.5. Why minus 0.5 to minus 0.75 aim? Sometimes, you know, minus 0.75 can land up in minus 1. The patient is a little unhappy. So minus 0.5 is good enough because these patients are all uh, uh, keeping the uh, near vision. The near point is uh, somewhere uh, around 45, 50 centimeters. And these lenses work very well. And with this micro monovision, uh, it's good enough for them. Yeah. Uh, occasionally, if they want, they'll use occasional readers like plus one. Yeah. So I, that's the way I go. And on, actually, uh, first side, we should target minus 0.5. If you target hematropia patient, by any chance, if there is an error, patient may become hypropic. So if you target minus 0.5, even if it becomes minus 0.75, then you can correct for the second eye and make it uh, make it uh, hematropic. So I target first eye slightly on the minus side and then uh, do the second eye and then correct accordingly. Because first eye, you target around hematropia, if it becomes hypropic, that, that is what we are not looking at it. What's your take on this, uh, Mayank? I mean, uh, would you like to chip in with your comment, with your views? No, I think I'm, I'm very similar to what uh, Dr. Mohan Rajan said. Um, I will target for distance in in these lenses. 
I, I normally like to do a study on the lens before I actually start using them. Uh, that's my trend um, because I need to understand the optics first. Uh, and once I understand the optics, then I'll use the lens. And most of these EDOFs and uh, enhanced monofocals are designed to be distantly emetropic. Now the company tweaks it for the marketing reasons to make it mini monovision and all the stuff just to sell it in, against the trifocals in the market. But that's it. That's not scientific. So how do you decide which lens to use? For example, you know, you divided the lenses into mostly three categories, as we all understand, like the, you know, the eye hands and uh, this group, the isopure group, and then the VVT group, and then the trifocal. Like, how do you, I mean, I know it's a huge question to ask you, but uh, if, if you had to tell in brief, like, uh, when would you choose one over the other and the other? So I'll, it depends on the patient's personality. If the patient is younger, wants uh, guaranteed reading vision, I'll go for trifocals, for sure. Because I don't want to take a chance with monovision or mini monovision with EDOFs in these patients. They are working patients. They're quite ambitious and um, they don't mind glare and halos. I'll be hammering them about glare and halos from the word go. So they will expect that. But if the patient is elderly, retired, doesn't do much of reading or close work, then I'll give the options of EDOFs. And if the patient um, can't afford the EDOFs because they're slightly expensive than the uh, NNs monofocals, then they will receive IHANS. Now, IHANS has become a gold standard monofocal for all of us in the UK at the moment. Uh, and surely in five years' time, EDOFs will be the gold standards. Would you be careful about using the EDOFs like the ones which are like the VVT kinds because there are occasional patients whose distance vision gets compromised at least for the initial few months? I mean, uh, we've had discussed this and seen this uh, as well. Uh, what's your uh, comment Yes, on that? Uh, the VVT patients do have um, some glare and halos issue, occasionally I would say, because it does have a ring inside. And um, the same applies with uh, a symphony because symphony is a diffractive lens. So I won't be using diffractive EDOFs um, as my gold standard in future, but uh, only refractive ones. Um, and also after counseling that there is a small chance, not as heavy as trifocals, to get the halos and glare. Boris, you want to quickly chip in with your choice, like uh, how you decide for these patients? So um, I, I, I usually, yeah, we, we, we talk about the broad... Uh, uh, the broad nomination of lenses, CDOF, monofocal plus. So uh, I think it's a bit of, uh, sometimes gener generates a bit of confusion in between uh, in between the doctors. So I uh, I love to use uh, EDOF lenses. However, um, trifocals are my first choice for, for sure. Uh, and uh, followed by monofocals. And then, uh, and then uh, I, I would say EDOF is the, third choice uh, uh, that is currently uh, my approach great great thank you so, Gaurav, uh, just to say even i personally we like the symphony was the first eat off that came in i'm not using symphony at all because it has all the problems that the multifocal lens has uh, but it it's really neither here nor there basically the monofocal plus uh, offers you almost uh, similar advantages as the EDOF as regards reading. And the pricing is significantly higher for an EDOF lens. Uh, so that's my, as uh, Boris uh, said, I will put it as my third choice. If a person really wants reading, reading, then it's either trifocal um, uh, or uh, if the person is happy with intermediate vision and distance vision, then under those circumstances, I'll just go for monofocal plus gives me a very safe range to play with. And the dysphotopsias in trifocals, the present generation trifocals, are in no way more than uh, what we are uh, experiences with the EDOF lenses. Great. Yeah, correct. So, uh, that, that kind of sums up uh, lots of things and very interesting studies, uh, Mayank, and we'll love, I would love to go through them, actually. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, your... I just have a doubt for Dr. Uh, yes, yes. One one small doubt. Yes. What about the residual elastic under you can also produce? We see many patients who have we have done SICS, ECC, long time, then they have a residual elastic matter of minus one, one point five cylinder, ninety degree. And these patients are having good vision for six, nine, and six, they're able to read without glasses. Uh, the residual elastic matter can also contribute to a lot to the pseudo accommodation component. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, that's what I started the presentation with. Uh, against the rule astigmatism is one of the, the old and conventional uh, idea. And that's based on the Stroom's conoid principle. Now, yes. that's not predictable. That's the only... Whereas these lenses give some predictability in pseudo-accommodation, but not full. 
So I think we are moving forward, but in 10 years time, we'll have more technologies to help us with pupil size and others, other things which I mentioned. Great. So if everybody permits, uh, can I invite uh, Dr. Arun Gulani? Yes, yes. Because I think he's past midnight in the US uh, and uh, he had requested that he can speak because yes, yes. he has requested last. Thank you so much. So Arun, uh, thank you for uh, being with us. Uh, he's going to be speaking on uh, new instrument uh, concept for minimalistic premium cataract surgery. He's uh, also got a lot of patents and I keep reading about them. So I think let's see what uh, interesting instrument concept Arun is going to share with us. Morning, Arun. Thank you so much. Great to see you all. And again, thanks for the invite, Gaurav uh, Santosh, for organizing this. I just saw you guys a uh, few days ago. And yes, it's mm -hmm. past midnight. I'm a little jet lagged, but I'd love to be here. So I'll start right away. I can share my screen. And very happy Republic Day to everybody in India. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Where's Ron? Tell him I dressed up for him. He said yeah, he'll yeah. be back. He's gone for the surgeries. He'll be back shortly. This is not the one. Okay, here we are. Can you see the screen? Are we are able to see it. Yes. 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 Perfect. Yes. So I was asked to speak about what's new, and uh, there's a new instrument that I've designed, which basically takes us away from tradition and makes the work even more elegant. Uh, minimalistic, and that's always my pursuit in premium cataract surgery. So the standard instruments that we use in cataract surgery are usually of vertical prominence and have a horizontal element or movement, which are indirect, less intuitive, and also more distant from the eyeball. Right? I've always wanted to have the eyeball become part of the surgeons, becoming one unit. And that control for which I designed this instrument that allows me to literally feel like my hand or my main finger is in the eye to do various functions that I want to. So I designed it like a thimble. I had some adjustable slits on the sides so that matches different fingers, different people, and has one multifunctional arm with which I can do all my procedures during the cataract surgery. <laughs> So basically, it's like a thimble, it's adjustable, it has one single multifunctional arm, and this is the only instrument I use besides my FACO equipment, making it a very simple surgery. As you know, all my surgeries are done topical without sedation, and no matter how complex the case, I'm very focused on outcome and patient experience. So I do not believe the lenses are what make anything premium, they're just an ingredient, the vision recipe, the flawless surgery, the artistry of the entire procedure, and the experience of the patient is what makes it premium. So true premium truly involves not only removal of the dysfunctional lens, but basically optically neutralizing every ametropia, no matter how extreme, getting it to a visually focused, bespoke surgical application with an amazing patient experience that the patient wants to talk about. That is truly premium and that has to be consistent. Also, these principles can be applied to a complete range of normal to extremely complex cases, which I don't even like to call cases complex. And since the topic of today is emetropia and cataract surgery, which it always should have been, we should take this to every extreme range that I'll talk about. As you all know, I love to show patients because I believe there is no higher accountability than patients on camera, especially these patients who come to me very skeptical, very damaged, very highly complex. So this is a normal patient cycle at my institute, but I insist on the premium being surgery, experience, and the, the minimalistic approach. These are immediately Great. patient so reactions in surgery, I can see. Okay. Oh, yeah. Super. 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 So this is important to see because this tells you we have to take cataract surgery to the level of where LASIK Actually, that two twenty years ago. So this should be a level where a patient right under the microscope, not LASIK patient, a cataract patient should say, wow, I can see and I'm amazed right under the microscope. So with this Genie instrument, I've been able to keep a single instrument. The benefits being I can move the eyeball through the paracentesis, I can stabilize it, I can give it counter traction to do my specific scleral techniques if I have to in difficult 40 cut RK cases. I can also manipulate the intraocular tissue with it break the nucleus anteriorly, posteriorly, differential cracking techniques, as you can see here. I can also arrange the toric lens. 
and high and deep eyes and extreme astigmatism in a zero incidence of post-surgical toric rotation that we've had with the two-hand technique with this uh, technology. No matter how complex, you can see down there a 38-cut uh, RK cataract and doesn't matter. I want no stitches. I want perfect, flawless experience, no sedation, patients under topical, and they should only remember a very pleasant, painless experience while you're aiming for excellence in vision. Again, just to addict to the same thing. Wintley Phipps, a voice and name recognized around the country, recently brought his booming baritone voice to Dr. Gulani's operating room. During the surgery, Phipps appeared comfortable and confident. Dr. Gulani says advancements have made cataract surgery more popular than ever. This is very important what I'm showing. It's the patient reaction in surgery. Of course, I want the reaction day one post-surgery and then 30 years later too, but in surgery is a direct reflection of how premium we are presenting as the entire system. Again, I repeat, all the time, the lens is not what makes it premium, it's just an ingredient. With number of patients, even today I corrected 19 patients with all the lenses that you all just discussed. None of the lens was a mistake, it was just put in the wrong eye. So the lens is important, but do not give it that much importance. It's you, the surgeon who's doing an amazing job. So no matter how complex the case, our aim is 2020, flawless, no sedation, minimalistic intervention of instruments, no jabbing in and out with big instruments, keeping it simple, and then keeping the surgery within four minutes topical for the patient experience. And no cataract is complex. If you look at the visual endpoint, the surgery will become artistry automatically. So keeping in mind, again, with the emetropic concept, the, again, the other concept I talk about is nothing is complex. Here are these cases also you're aiming for straight 2020, 2025, 2030, despite their very irregular corneas, extreme astigmatisms, no matter how high they are, and what kind of cataract they have. I don't even classify the cataracts. Every patient deserves the best vision at the most premium experience. And the instrument that helps me do this, keeping it minimalistic, again, no going in and out with multiple instruments, no losing the fluidics for the same reason. One portion stays in the, in the eye, like, you know, you're a unit with the eyeball, with that thimble in the eye. And that instrumentation, I think, should change, cause a paradigm shift in the way we do eye surgery. You can see here patients are pre and post-op, high astigmatism, doesn't matter. Manipulate that with a toric lens inside the eye. Here's a typical example of cases that come to me, nine previous surgeries, 89 diopter keratometry, 23.5 astigmatism. So we first did an intact, brought the astigmatism down to 1.4, then did a toric this lens. This is a 75-year-old nurse who was to me following hexagonal keratotomy with corneolectasia, vision of crown fingers only, and pukes dystrophy along with associated cataract and high keratometry of 88 with high irregular astigmatism of 23.5. I planned first to stabilize and make her cornea measurable in sync for future cataract surgery. Here I'm using intacts and as you can see me, I'm using her own corneal resistance to guide my intact rings in place. I'm doing this without any sharp intervention so I don't make mistakenly any incision that can go into the hexagonal keratotomy guts and perforate the cornea. Again, notice these are very determined yet very careful movements of the ring, and I'm placing them so as to embrace this central unstable island. The success of this is immediately reflected in the central light reflex, if you notice, which is becoming more and more circular, and I call this the titratable uh, concept of intact surgery. Notice again, the light reflex is now a perfect circle. I'm extremely pleased to the point that I confidently cross-link. This success is reflected in topography from 23.5 to 1.4 diopter astigmatism. Patient extremely happy, comes dressed next day to meet me. Four months after determining stability of this cornea so we can determine accurate cataract surgery, we proceed here. Dry pan blue for the observing surgeons. Viscoelastic exchange. I plan my capsular excess to be a smaller size so I can see the edges between the hex cake cuts and the intact reflections, and also to maintain a good lens and capsular diaphragm. I now proceed with what we call pacoplastic, which is doing cataract surgery also in determined steps, 
like you see, my phaco probe is not moving. It stays in one place while my second hand does most of the movement to maintain a stable incision, similarly with the IA and lens insertion here. Lens is now being placed in the bag and then gently moved into its axis. Again, irrigation aspiration, well-sealed incision, further uh, reinforced with reshore sealant, no stitch to induce any astigmatism. So here we have taken a patient who was denied her vision for 60 years. In two few minutes surgeries, four months apart, we have restored her vision and her confidence to give her back her life where she's come back to nursing and helping other patients. Here she is immediately after surgery, and here is my payback, seeing them smile and uh, free to lead their life and help others. So again, no matter what, how complicated the cataract, you can even stage it. Here are patients with extreme LASIK complications who are sent over how to fool the optics. And that's the main thing to do. And again, keeping it minimalistic, the fact that the Genie instrument is what I use in my FACO surgeries keeps it minimalistic, simple, but also the thought process of premium keeping in track with our present topic for today's topics being emetropia all the time. So you can take how you can stage these extreme scars, very high regular corneas, and take them straight to cataract surgery. Here you can see patients, you can stabilize like you saw with intacts, keratorings, rings, whatever you have. You use ferro rings and you can do that. Stabilize it, go in with a simple surgery, manipulate the optics. Here are ways also of reversing complications that are sent over to me without barbaric surgery. That's the point. No surgical acrobatics in the eye. Artistically, minimalistically, optically, intelligently, artistic surgery to bring them to 2020. So here's a patient you can see, had a bad outcome of her multifocal lens with a bad laser surgery scar, how we went and put a piggyback, manipulated her optics and with the laser to 2020. Here's a patient with 12 failed surgeries in keratoconus. You can see PRK, intact, cross-linking, uh, LASIK, uh, now a cataract, and ICL in the eye. Reverse the ICL, you all know from then on, it's very easy as long as it's measurable. In these cases, I do my one week aphakic technique, which when the cornea is completely immeasurable, I then go in, leave the patient aphakic, measure the refraction at day one and one week, and then go in with full confidence with the toric lens straight to 2020. Here are cases where you can combine your corneal concepts with the, with the cataract. The Again, relentless in your desire for minimalistic. This is an oral surgeon. That's with high regular stigmatism of over 15 diopters. And I plan an anterior hand lamellar keratoplasty here judging the RK incisions that are open and very fragile, cornea less than 300 microns. See the incisions here in high magnification, open as I've done yesterday, very deep and crisscrossing. So I have to be very careful because I have a danger of both anterior to this blade where anything can just split open and posterior where I can literally go inside the eye if I make any mistake of using wrong pressure or being in the wrong plane. So you're now taking off the scar from the roofing the scars of the RK. Again, using my corneal resistance guided technique. I'm now using a donor lenticle of cornea. Every time my incision uh, sutures are coming out, I'm actually gathering three pieces of the cornea recipient to donor and arranging them in a closed fashion. My anti torque suture, usually I love for it to look like a star, but this is asymmetric because of the way we had to come out in different areas. This is the pre and post. And then underwent toric cataract surgery with no stitches or sedation through this reconstructed and accurately measurable cornea to create two vision. And here he is right on surgery. So the very concept of using minimalistic surgical instruments, no in and out of the eye, keeping it very simple, being in touch with the patient, being one unit with your patient. You know, when you do the salsa, you're dancing with a partner, but you're vigorously away. When you're doing the waltz, you're holding your partner. You are one unit. That's how it should be in eye surgery. And that instrument helps us do that. And then the complexity is out the window. You just want absolute premium experience, excellent, consistent outcomes, irrespective of how complex the situation is. Thank you for your attention. Fantastic, Karun. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Arun. That was uh, actually brilliant. And that uh, RK, welcome, uh, Dr. Lahane, sir. I, I can see that he's also, sir. Morning. Uh, very good morning to you, sir. So, Arun. Uh, good, good morning. Good morning, yeah. sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I was intrigued by the, uh, your, uh, you know, in that RKI when you were removing the scar. So, how do you decide the plane at which you're, you know, kind of going to go, uh, you know, go and uh, kind of was it uh, sub epithelial or wherever you you were into a pocket and trying to, you know, find your way. It looked very kind of, uh, you know, 
uh, difficult uh, step to do and can you tell us more about it like how you created that plane and uh, found this car so you're talking about the surgeon uh, on which i did the lamellar technique right 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 so absolutely. yes surely so what i do in those cases first of all 100% of our case 100% of them the scars can be peeled off mm -hmm. Do give respect to the surgeon who did the RK. I never believed in RK. I never did a single one. I don't know why I've become the center for the world for RK correction now. But in my experience, there is no scar of RK that cannot be peeled off. And go with full confidence, the RK will not open up, even these cases that I showed. Now, in that case, why did I do a lamellar and not just proceed with my cataract, despite me doing 40-cut RK cataracts all the time, was that cornea was immeasurable, 300 microns, centrally scarred, and he had the same problem in both eyes. So I decided to go hand lamellar, which is a very easy surgery, 11-minute surgery that every refractive surgeon knows. I go with a tree fine. I went down 200 microns. Then with the diamond, I found my one area where everything wasn't split. You see, he had 30 cuts, but he also had peripheral circumferential cuts of AKs that were done like crazy. So everything was pieces. I never used a blaze in the cornea, but in that eye, I did because that eye was hypotonic and there was no plane. So I wanted to keep it sharp and move in one plane. Usually I like to use a dissector that I have a multi-lamellar. So if you go down 200 micron, that is enough for you. Again, law of optics, no need to go after all the scars because anterior scars matter, posterior do not. So when you go 200, I was able to go into a plane where I lifted off the front scars, peeled off the roofs of the other scars. And now I knew my cornea will become measurable. And I added tissue that was one and a half times thicker. I usually take my anti-torx suture, the eight byte, but I had to, in this case, go through three pieces, the RK, the recipient, and the donor, and yet try and keep it symmetric. That was what the difficult part was. Once we did that, three months for stability. And then it was so stable, went in with a toric lens, again, sutureless, topical, one instrument surgery, and you're done. So, Arun, uh, there's another question. Like some of these corneas which you showed, which are like uh, with so many cuts, they will be flatter than what most optical biometers will measure. For example, for keratometry, you know, because most of our biometers don't go below like uh, 30 um, diopters on keratometry. And some of these corneas are like 23, 24, 25 diopters. And, uh, you know, they are really, really flat. Uh, so how do you, what, I mean, for your ILPAR calculation, uh, for your keratometry, what are you uh, using for these really flat measurements? Uh, like, you know, even the lens star or the ILPAR, master 700 or even the anterior will not measure them they are so flat so what case would you use and how would you derive them so this is of course very important takes time i have all these technologies i will sevens fives all these that measure it obviously go with the flattest of all of them and then by experience i go by the number of cuts so when somebody has more than eight there's an algorithm that i've developed over the years more than eight cuts i go another 1.5 above more than 16 i go 2.5 above and that brings me into a range of close to emetropia now here's the greatest part of doing rk cataract surgery if the rk is that flat you do want this patient to have a prolate cornea in the future so i in fact make them uh, hyper hello i think go ahead i think that came by mistake so you want to make these patients actually hyperopic. Now, these are two-stage techniques. I usually do all these one stage, but if this patient's cornea is 24, 25, you know that vision is very poor from the how oblate the cornea is. So I actually aim for hyperopia. Then I come back and do surface laser surgery three months later, bring them at least close to 34, 35, and that amazes them because they get their distance, near and night vision, all three which were missing all these years of their RK. So cataract surgery to me, is an excuse to manipulate optics. I don't care about the surgery. So every time you see my talks, I don't dwell on the cooking. I look at how's the person looking at the food on the table. Are they really salivating? Are they really enjoying the aroma and the taste? So once we look at that angle, the vision and the optics, surgery becomes very simple. You have to insist on not taking a stitch. I do not like anybody taking a stitch, even in 40 cut RK, because that causes <laughs> irregularity, then there is no discussion of what lens is being used. That is a bizarre topic. So the intensity has to be 40, 44 cut RK. Two days ago, I did that 38 cut RK one, no stitches. And you let the cornea settle down and give credit to the RK surgeon, even though you never like it, because they had tried to make the patient see. So the fact is that cornea at some point had worked. With that attitude, if we go, all these patients do extremely well. 
So I think Boris would have a huge experience with RKI. Is anything that you would like to chip in for these really, really? Uh, smart companies, Boris? My next talk is on the RKI. I think you can take a discussion after. Okay, okay. So we can do that after this, maybe. And uh, please go ahead, sir. Dr. Arvind Lal, sir, is the president, and uh, we would love to hear him. Uh, and he's a prolific cataract surgeon as well. <laughs> my screen I already shared. Uh, uh, we can't see the screen yet, sir. No, I'm able to see the screen. So is is my screen visible? No, sir. No, no, no. For a moment, it had come previously, like five minutes back. But so now, it's, I I think then they removed it. I, I think I'll do it again then. So maybe somebody from the back end can help you with that. Yeah, sir has to uh, share the screen again, sir. Is it visible now? Not yet, sir. I have to join again. Am I visible there? Uh, no, sir. You are visible, you are audible. Sir, on the Zoom screen, can you click the share screen button, green wala? Share screen, sir. Share screen, to manne pahle kiya tha, yaar. Ah, so, you may have to redo it. Tha. You may have to redo it, sir. Now, I don't see that button because... Sir, you go to the bottom of the screen and click on Zoom first. I think uh, what happened is that you've come to the screen uh, which you were trying to share. Just click on Zoom. So once you see all of us, then you will see the share screen button. So just find the icon for Zoom and click on that first. No? No, I... I think somebody from backend can help, sir, and maybe we can uh, try to like have the next talk and then come back to Dr. Harban, sir, or, or he can mail the presentation to... Kripal or somebody, I don't know. I think yes, he's sir. Locked down. No, sir, we will sort. Uh, we'll sort him. I'll sort him out. Maybe you. Sure. So we we'll go ahead with Boris's sir. talk then. I think he's next, and uh, Boris is going to speak to us on a very interesting topic as well. If uh, Dr. Harbans permits, we'll proceed. So uh, I've heard this talk once before, and it's amazing to hear this. So Boris is going to speak on anterior vitreous detachment. Can it be prevented? And it's uh, let's hear this. It's really nice. We keep talking of posterior vitreous detachment, but let's hear about anterior vitreous detachment. Uh. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir, you are audible. Okay, uh, perfect. So I, I would like to thank uh, for this kind invitation, uh, which is my honor to be here today. And uh, I will. I would like to highlight the the very interesting topic of anterior vitreous detachment. Uh, we know uh, uh, that historically, the area of vitreo lenticular interface was studied in 19th century by uh, big names in anatomy and uh, ophthalmology, such as Wigger, Ber Berger. And you can see the edge of the lens, uh, zonular fibers, ciliary body, and uh, canal PT, uh, and uh, anterior vitreous uh, 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 hyaloid. Uh, we also can see here the Berger space at the very center, which is located in between the posterior surface of the uh, lens capsule and uh, the anterior vitreous hyaloid. Here is the vigorous ligament and uh, canal PT uh, located to the periphery of the capsular bag. So just to remind you that vigorous ligament uh, is how it is projected on the posterior capsule, and we, we, we should keep that in mind that uh, uh, you see that uh, about five millimeter in diameter uh, uh, at the, from the center of the capsule, we, we can see with this red line, which is presenting the vigorous ligament. What is uh, important, uh, 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 this is because we can actually study the retrolenticular space with interoperative OCT. Uh, we have different... Uh, uh, machines now, uh, at least three manufacturers allow us to do that. Uh, and uh, you can see this is the Berger space, and uh, we can see it here, uh, the posterior lens surface, the uh, posterior capsule, and the Berger space. 
uh, which is located in between the posterior capsule and the anterior vitreous hyaloid. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, this is uh, the finding that uh, was uh, really uh, goes back to 1993 and 1991 uh, when uh, Richard McCool observed this. Uh, uh, sorry for that. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, accumulation of the irrigation fluid behind the posterior capsule, and he called this infusion misdirection syndrome. Uh, and, and when the uh, irrigation fluid comes through the zonal fibers, goes behind the posterior capsule and lifts this capsule upwards, making the capsule prolate. Uh, and uh, this definitely increases the risk of complications. And sometimes you can see these uh, small particles that are located uh, behind the posterior capsule uh, uh, on the face of the anterior vitreous hyaloid. That gives you an idea about the, uh, the fact that in this case, the zonal are uh, permeable to these particles and the anterior vitreous hyaloid is detached and the vigorous ligament is ruptured. Uh, how these particles goes into the uh, retrolenticular space, just through the zonules, and as shown here, and they are accumulated here uh, uh, in between the posterior lens capsule and the anterior vitreous hyaloid. So these particles can be observed uh, uh, during the intraoperative OCT, uh, as shown here, uh, and represented by the yellow uh, arrows. Uh, so the proof of concept that these particles are located behind the capsule in front of the uh, of the anterior vitreous hyaloid can be achieved by injecting triamcinolone acetonide uh, through the zonules. And you can see here uh, the uh, triamcinolone is injected and then uh, washed out from the anterior chamber. And these white uh, dots showing you the uh, the uh, particles of triamcinolone located uh, on uh, on the surface of the anterior vitreous hyaloid, which is also can be seen postoperatively on anterior segment OCT, and you can see these particles accumulated here and here, uh, uh, actually showing that the um, vitreous face is intact. So what's happening? Uh, during uh, fecal emulsification or irrigation aspiration, when the vitreo, when when the fluid goes behind the posterior capsule, so it, it is uh, aspirated um, by it can be aspirated by the aspiration headpiece, creating the 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 rupture of the posterior capsule, and we published on that uh, in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery several years ago. So uh, we know that the anterior vitreous detachment can happen during the surgery or have uh, uh, can happen before the surgery, and we just see it uh, intraoperatively. So the predisposing conditions for uh, uh, for that are age related, comorbidity related, and uh, obviously intraoperative uh, when the fluid um, is going uh, behind the posterior capsule. And detaches the uh, the the capsule from the anterior vitreous hyaloid, and uh, with anterior chamber fluctuations, it makes it uh, 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 more frequent. So you see how these irrigation currents are uh, going inside the uh, inside the uh, Berger space and lifts the posterior capsule. So how can we prevent that? Uh, so uh, we 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 thought that. It might be a good idea to uh, separate the anterior chamber from uh, the uh, retrolenticular space, and that can be done by injecting viscoelastic uh, on top of the zonules. And this is done uh, with a donut-shaped uh, technique. So when injection is done all over the circumference of of the zonal fibers, so with that you actually separate the anterior capsule and does not allow the fluid uh, to go through the uh, through the zonules and this is uh, how it is done 
uh, during the surgery. I, I make the main incisions and top paracentesis, and I am using uh, a dispersive OVD first to fill in the chamber and then to inject behind the iris. Uh, and uh, I, of course, I'm using different uh, incisions to uh, inject OVD um, um, 360 degrees as shown here. So, and with that, I'm trying to separate the anterior and posterior segments. Um, during uh, injection, we, we can actually see how the iris lifts uh, above the anterior lens capsule, which is represented by the white arrows. This is right after injection and uh, after uh, about 30 to 40 seconds, the uh, viscoelastic uh, disperses around the anterior chamber structures and we can see that the this leaf is much uh, lower. Uh, so actually representing uh, the fact that uh, viscoelastic is still located behind the iris. So we try to assess the behavior of the posterior capsule on different steps of the surgery. Step one after nucleus removal prior to irrigation aspiration. Step two after aspiration irrigation of the cortical material. And step three uh, after IOL implantation during OVD removal. And you can see here, this is the posterior surface of the uh, 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 of, the, of the capsule, and this is the anterior uh, 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 vitreous uh, hyaloid, as shown on on these pictures. So, uh, what we've got, we've two, uh, we've got two groups: one with visco block, and the other uh, we we call it tech, this technique visco block, uh, and the other is control. Uh, all of them uh, are more or less equal. So we've seen that uh, in spite of the fact that the viscoelastic was behind the iris, we still sometimes uh, uh, were being able to see uh, fluctuations of the posterior capsule. Sometimes we've seen the prolate form of the capsule and uh, uh, decrease of the volume. And we were being able to see the anterior vitreous detachments uh, the disadvantage of this technique, we, we've seen that accumulation of the uh, viscoelastic behind the uh, the iris and make it more prone for the iris prolapse on, on different uh, uh, on different stages of the surgical procedure. So this technique is not immune of some disadvantages. So to conclude, uh, uh, first of all, infusion misdirection syndrome. Uh, is when the irrigation fluid accumulates behind the posterior capsule, um, between posterior capsule and anterior hyaloid membrane. And it is a predisposing factor um, uh, uh, that make it, uh, this situation prone uh, for a posterior capsule rupture. So viscoblock reduce anterior vit vitreous detachment down to 24% as compared to 56% in the control group. However, we were not being able to uh, uh, to eliminate this uh, anterior vitreous detachment 100%, probably due to the fact that some fluid still comes through the zonules, through the viscoelastic, or maybe there are some predisposing detachments. So this is still not very clear. However, we faced that this technique was uh, giving us a little bit increased uh, risk of iris prolapse during surgery. So we, we think that uh, the research on in this area is still a need to be done. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. Amazing, amazing talk, uh, Boris. So any comments from our panelists, Dr. Harban, sir, Dr. Alhane, sir? I, I think I, um, I, excellent concept. Uh, we have seen many times these are particles, but we never thought what is actually happening. So I think a very good concept and a wonderful presentation and very well documented. So is it the pseudo exfoliation eyes as well, uh, Boris? Which uh, have you? Which subgroup of eyes uh, would you be careful about? And you know, if you had didn't want to do this for all your patients, uh, which are the patients you would pick where you would want to do this? I think the 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 we 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 see the anterior vitreous detachment more frequent 
with uh, mature cataracts, white cataracts. And I think this uh, this uh, matches with the uh, the degradation of the zonal fibers. And also with pseudo exfoliative syndrome, we know that uh, it affects zonal fibers. So we, we, we think that uh, this technique might be uh, more useful in this group of patients, not not for all of the patients. Obviously, you you don't uh, you 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 won't consider that using in a regular um, uh, age related cataract without any complications. So there is still a road to be to be uh, uh, to be ahead. Uh, so because we 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 still uh, did not define the optimal uh, surgical technique and the optimal group of the patient to uh, to administer that technique but i think it's a it's the right direction so we need to separate anterior segment for the, from the posterior segment and that will decrease our rates of complication in specific cases fantastic gamayan can you like to chip in with something before we go ahead okay after that dr mohan uh, yes uh, no uh, nothing it's a fantastic presentation i think the concept actually uh, can be expanded to several other specialties like glaucoma and um, uh, VR surgery as well. So I think that this is very useful, Boris. Congratulations to you and your team. Fantastic. So, Dr. Mohan, you want yeah. to say? No, no, actually, Boris, uh, we are, I've heard this talk. Uh, we lost your audio, Mohan, sir. And how we have developed this concept. It's more common than what you can imagine, actually. This problem. Yeah. Are you able to hear me? Now Hello? we can hear you. Now we can hear you. Uh, it's more common. This problem is actually more common than what you can imagine. Uh, because uh, uh, we find that the patient pseudo exfoliation, we have a huge amount of pseudo exfoliation patients here in our country. Mature cataracts, hypermature cataracts, high myopia. Again, there's a space for the, uh, the fluid to go underneath and hydrate the vitreous and push the posterior capsule forward. So all these problems can occur, and uh, this is the way. Uh, we used to uh, um, put a 24-gauge needle into the anterior vit vitreous and aspirate the fluid from that. But nowadays, uh, if there is a lot of uh, intraocular pressure going up and there's a fluid misdirection, I put a trocar and cannula uh, into the into the anterior vitreous. Is that the way to go, or uh, you, uh, you says that? And what viscoelastic? I use usually use viscoat. The viscoat is the one which goes and blocks that area and stays there forever yeah these uh, are two I, things I wanted. Uh, yeah mohan i uh, you correctly stated that this quote is probably the best and i mentioned that we use dispersive ovd uh because uh, it stays and it's it's uh much harder to wash out uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to to place the trocar cannula in uh, in many of uh, the cases, uh, rather okay. if it's uh, malignant uh, infusion misdirection syndrome, but which gives you uh, a big pressure in the posterior segment. Um, uh, and this is in this rare case, I, I agree with you that uh, it might uh, work and help very much. However, in majority of cases, uh, this infusion misdirection syndrome does not give us the uh, increase of the pressure, uh, but rather the fluctuating of the capsule. And for that, of course, we, we would like to avoid uh, to do any uh, more invasive maneuvers uh, uh, that can ruin uh, the anterior hyoid and create uh, different other issues. So, um, uh, so. Again, as I mentioned, there is a still road to be to be done. Some of my colleagues are trying to uh, use posterior uh, capsulorexis for these particular cases uh, in order to. Uh, uh, the, this concept is quite opposite. They, they want to create the uh, the common space in between the anterior and the posterior chambers uh, to avoid this fluctuation. So, so there are two opposite roads whether to create the common space or separate two spaces. And I currently, I don't know which one is better, but we'll find in the future. So thanks a lot, uh, Boris, and thanks to everybody for the discussion. I think we should go on to Dr. Harbans's talk now. Uh, we're looking forward to Sir's talk. Uh, can you start, sir? Is my screen visible now? Yes, sir, it's yes, visible. Sir. 
Yes, yes. So my talk is on post radial keratotomy IV selection because uh, uh, as we know that the surgery is not a problem. It is the IV selection in these cases which is more problematic. And for those who do not know how the RK used to work, we used to give a radial cuts which used to cause paracentral steepening and a central flattening. And this process keeps on happening over a period of lifetime of the patient. And there are studies published that this hyperopic shift keeps on happening. And these patients also have a myopic shift. In the night when they sleep, there is a hypoxia. So in the morning, they may be hyperopic. In the evening, they may become the myopic. So whenever we want to operate these cases, we have a little problem in deciding what are your power. If there is an asymptotic, what is the axis and power and whether we should use the toric IU or not. So if vision improves with the cylindrical correction in spectacles, the toric IU should be used. If the contact lens user, you should avoid the toric IU because the contact lens will give the best possible vision. When we want to see at the keratometry, maximum flattening is in the center while the major paracentral area, which is much steeper. Cornea is irregular with wide variation in the reading. Optical biometer may not measure at the lens. The star's lowest reading is 34 diopter. There may be actasia with high keratometric values of 54, which may not be measured. Calculate biometer with the flattest reading, biometry with the flattest. The relationship with the corneal power and eye power is almost 1 is to 1. That means if there is a keratometric value of 1 diopter, is not correct, patient will have a refractive error of 1 diopter. And if the characterometric value is more than 38, be careful, you may not be measuring at a right place. So just to, I'll give you some of the my cases where we learned. This was a case of 51-year-old male, RK 15 years back. Best corrected visual acuity was 612. His subjective refraction was minus 4, minus 3.5 at 170 degree. And on the lens star, average K was 37.49. And the IOL power which we are getting was 13.5 and the cylindrical was 3.78. On the pentacam, the reading was at the 3 million per zone 39.5. So once we calculated an IOL calc ASCRS dot R, so the average IOL power was 11.73, minimum 10.13 and maximum was 13.56, which matched actually with the biometric reading. The reason over here being that the biometer was actually giving the flatter reading than the pentacam. So the flattest reading may not necessarily be with the pentacam. And I usually target minus one in these patients. And at the see the cylindrical power in, in this patient was absolutely no confusion about it because all of them measured more or less same axis and the same power. And we target minus one. So it became 15 adapter of IUL with 5.25 uh, selection was done and if we think over it this was a perfect choice or not because patient was myopic and the spherical equivalent was minus 6.25 so this i will see perfectly all right and patient had an accident reject. now there is another patient 56 year old female rk 30 years back the vision was this 36 in both eyes and if you see the optical biometer the, uh, the average K was 36.71, 33.75 and 40 and cylindrical power was 6.25 at 172 degree. And you see at Pentacam, it was average K was 32.5 and the axis was 149. And once we calculated with the minus one, it came out to be 29.04. So if you see the biometric value was 21 diopter because optical biometer value average was 36 while well, Pentacam was 32.5. So in this case, it would have gone with the optical biometer, would have been totally off the target. And at the same time, now if you see the axis is 172 at the biometer, Pentacam 149. If the cornea is irregular, then the patient's refraction is equally important. I mean, I'll call it more important than actually the optical biometer or Pentacam reading. So if you see the autorefractometer reading or the acceptance of the patient was at 165 degree. So we use the lens at 165 degree, neither at 149 nor at 172. So in an irregular cornea, what a spectral patient is uh, accepting that is much more important than any of these reading. 
this is another patient we uh, this is which, what gave me the insight into this surgery this is 52 52 <clears> years <throat> in 32 rk incisions vision of finger counting and if you see over here the biometry what we was getting was 10.5 the, if you see the keratometric values, 37.5 and 46.80, and average was 41.62. And at IOL CAL, the average was 9.79, minimum was 10.7, maximum was 11.52. We went for 12.5 adapter. And three weeks post of patient had undilated AR reading of 13.5 plus 1.5, and acceptance was plus 9 and plus 4.5 adapter at 140 degree. So where was the mistake? If you see the 1K rating was 46.80. So instead of measuring the flat K, we actually measured the actitic cornea. And the average K was 41.62, which should not have been there with the 32 incision. And the now the, uh, the some of these patients may have postoperatively transient hypropia. And if you see that, the, the, uh, the keratometric rating is going down, the pachymetry is going down and the hypropia is coming down. That means the patient is having a transient hypropia. And then wait for, and there, some of these patients may have a transient hypropia up to four diopter or so because of the cornea gets swollen up and this can cause hypropia. So we do wait for two weeks, keep on giving the hypertonic saline, uh, keep on doing subjective testing every two weeks, keep on measuring the cornea thickness. If patient keeps on improving, wait for eight to 12 weeks. And if patient is not improving, then you can plan for the IUL action. So we went for the IUL action in this, and we used the 27 adapter of the IUL in this patient. And at the end, his refraction was minus 2 plus 0.5 at 145 degrees. Still, patient had plus 0.5 spherical equivalent of the error. So optical biometer normally gives one adapter of IUL power, changes the refraction by 0.67. So if we do that by one and a half time up, uh, we take that into the consideration. That means uh, the total spherical equivalent of this patient was plus nine, plus 4.5, 11.25. And if the 11.25 multiplied by 1.5 becomes 16.87. If we add 12.5 and 16.87, it becomes 29.37. So instead of 27, probably patient needed 29 adapter of IL power in this case. So the in the case four, IOL power calculation was coming absolutely have or anything between plus two and minus six. So this patient, we just operated cataract and planned for the secondary IOL. Post of refraction was 13 and we implanted the 26 adapter of uh, IOL in this patient. So in our fake patients, as we know, when we used to do the, uh, we were not using IOL at that time, the patient needed around 10.5 diopter of IOL and most of the metro patient needs around 21 diopter. So in a fake patient, the ratio is nearly 1 is to 2. While if the patient on a piggyback IOL, when we are trying to use the one lens over the other, then the factor is nearly 1.5. So whatever is the effective error, you have to multiply. So if you see in the case 1, because the optical biometer reading was flatter than the pentacam reading, so the IOL mm -hmm. power which we got was good. And there was excellent agreement for the asymptotes on all the equipment, so there was no confusion. In the case two, the pentacam reading was much, much flatter than the optical biometer. So we have got to take the pentacam reading. And in the asymptotes, because there was a disagreement between the pentacam and the optical biometer, so when went by the patient's affection. And in the case three, where we actually, the reading was 46.80, instead of measuring the Flatter K, we actually measured the paracentral and we used the IOL, which was 12 adapter and absolutely wrong. So, lesson learned is that the flattest scatometric value is to be used. You calculate on the IOL calc ASS.R. Target refractor should be anything between minus 0.5 to minus 2 adapter. More the cuts, more minus I plan. Any keratometric value above 40, it may be paracentral. Any biometric value below 18 adapters cross check the K values and refraction whether it is myopic or hypopic. If it is myopic, only then uh, this uh, IOL power is all right. Most of these patients, because I got a flatter K, will need the IOL power somewhere between 24 and 28 adapters. So, any variation, you have got to be very, very careful. Okay, thank you, uh, everybody.
brilliant talbanj very uh, wonderful cases uh, let's hear view of uh, our panelist when it comes to post rgi iol selection uh, lahane sir is here with us morning sir yes i am there yes i am there yeah so you are when uh, yes when the we, patients are coming with the post rk uh, in that i think the what herbal said is very true but we will have to also see the uh, posterior surface and now there are machines where we can measure the uh, uh, posterior surface of the cornea and uh, because of that that is always helping for the calculation in the iol power in such of rk cases but after that also uh, when we uh, implant an iol second day there may be a, a surprises uh, we always see so in rk cases it is a uh, very difficult uh, for the calculation but if you do it properly definitely we can uh, my experience is uh, yes uh, definitely that is helping uh, in the cases where Uh, we are measuring the uh, contour of the posterior surface of the cornea. Doctor, Doctor Mohan Rajan, sir, uh, you would want to come. No, in. let me compliment Arvind for the wonderful uh, press. I think he covered everything there. Uh, the only thing, is, as he rightly said, true net. Central power for the current power calculation in RK is concerned. So R is central. The true net you need to center. That, that's very important. We have uh, machines like Pentacam and Iol Master seven hundred. Everything can give that, and we have the Barrett Suite as well. So we can have the post RK formula. We have access to Iol Master seven hundred. You can do that with the Barrett Suite. All the formulas are available, and. Um, Mohan Rajan sir, we uh, seems to have some network issue from your end. Uh, Doctor Boris, would you like to share your views? Sorry, I I just missed the the conversation. I was distracted by the other. Yes, uh, so we are talking about the post RK uh, IOL selection and. Uh, 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 okay, this is the talk that was uh, before. Yeah. you know the sum formulas does not provide us the uh, the possibility to make calculations when the cornea is flatter than uh, 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 than 36 or 38 uh, diopters so when we talk about extreme cases like uh, 28 or something so i, I always uh, talk to my patients that we will do our best guess we do a lot of uh, formulas however i cannot exclude that the iol exchange can be can be done at the early uh, post operative period so and with that uh, uh, most of the uh, most of the patients are are okay with that approach uh, although it's sometimes uh, uh, not quite uh, clear um uh, when it is better to use uh, penetrating keratoplasty for for instance Uh, rather than uh, trying to uh, to uh, do to make our best guess for iol power calculations for me the threshold is in astigmatism uh, which is irregular and high and in these cases i i would like to do as a first step radial um, uh, penetrating keratoplasty uh, following that uh, doing uh, iol surgery and correct the res residual astigmatism that sometimes happen after mm, penetrating keratoplasty so it's it's like that scleral contact lenses are uh, the other uh, good option however at least uh, mm, the specialists whom i am working are not happy to uh, provide scleral contact lenses for patients after radial keratotomy because they are sometimes concerned that the incisions will not be stable enough Uh, and provide uh, uh, the safety for these scleral lenses. So, if possible, I I will encourage uh, to do scleral lenses. However, Hello, uh, sorry, Arti. In most of the cases. 
So if the if patient is me, using scleral lenses, then absolutely there is no problem in doing the RK surgery because whatever is the refractive error then can be covered on a letter by the contact lenses itself. So there is absolutely uh, no confusion. And even if you are wrong on the biometric calculation, it's perfectly all right. So in other cases, uh, when you want to use the toric eye will, because the cornea is so disturbed and the wherever the patient's acceptance is, is the actually proof from where he's seeing clearly. So if he's using the spectacles with the cylindrical power in this, and if you can, usually these patients come early for the cataract surgery. They don't delay because there's a contrast is so much large, there's so much of a disturbance. So you can still do subjective testing and checking up these patients. So the spectacle prescription is the key in these cases. I've seen many patients, recently I operated, what are maybe the cratometric value? Cratometric value <laughs> for the total IO power calculation that also can be calculated on the basis of the refraction itself. Like if you say that emetropic patient needs 21 diopter, the patient is hypropic by 6 diopter, at 6 and 1 and a half time of that, that means 9 diopter, this patient needs an IO power around 30 diopter or so. So you need to, the patient's refraction is key in deciding what asymptotism, what axis, and what power. So, of course, we take the help of the Pentacam, Biometer, IOCALC, ASCRS, but their refraction is very, very important in these patients with the cornea is Sorry, Arti, I had to go. Sorry. Welcome Sorry back, Mohan Rajan, sir, again. No, no, yeah. no, no, my laptop suddenly closed up. So, conked, so I had to reconnect. The, the, yeah. Anyway, well, Arban just covered everything. But only thing is, uh, during the surgery, I would prefer uh, lesser number of incisions into the coil, into the eye. I do the, the posterior limbus or even a scleral incision. Yeah. Even the side port may be a little posterior limbus. And uh, lesser manipulation, uh, reduce the bottle height. So, uh, Perfectly more cuts, you are more problem. Uh, very difficult to do the incision as well. No, uh, Mohan Rajan very rightly said. If you yeah, we covered scleral, everything, I think. If yeah. you go scleral and deeper, that means there's a 300 micron, go 500, 600 micron, cut the conjunctiva, go scleral, they, you, uh, they won't want to open up. So uh, I think the discussion is going on very interesting, but uh, in interest of time, we've reached towards the end of our session. And um, I request cha our chairman for the session, Dr. Harban Salal, sir, to please give the closing comments. And after that, we will have a group, group photograph. So I'll uh, request all of you to please switch on your videos and give the best smile uh, so that I'll click the photo and then we will, yeah. So I think it was a, a very lively and uh, uh, excellent session. And we really had some wonderful and original talks and very informative and uh, all the speakers just uh, did justice to their name and fame they have we are proud that they really joined us and thank you every one of you for being here early morning thank you very much thank you sir so i'm i'm ready for the screenshot yeah, yeah. so requesting everyone yeah. to give their best smile yeah so I would like to thank each one of you for making the opening session so very interesting. And I have learned a lot from this session. And um, just to remind our audience, we will move moving on to our next session, which will be starting at sharp at 11.45 in Hall B, which is on ocular surface disorders. So thank you again once. Um, see you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Arti. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, sir.